Hey everyone, we've got another heart today. This is number 332 in our collection, I believe. Oh, sorry, this is number 832 in our collection. The heart would have sat roughly in the chest like this. Obviously, you can see that the anterior wall has been removed largely, but the anterior surface would have been here towards the screen. Posterior surface towards the turntable. Superior head up here. Inferior legs down here. Left over here, right over here. So why don't we go ahead and start off as we usually do, which is by trying to identify, at least externally, the right atrial appendage. And here we find an appendage that's triangular, broad-based or pyramidal in shape. So let's go ahead and open up the heart here. And when we do that, we find that there are pectinate muscles that spill outside the confines of the appendage itself, consistent with a morphologic right atrium. Then we do see that the, oops, here is the oval fossa, and the oval fossa isn't intact. So there is no interatrial communication. And then here we find the mouth of the coronary sinus. And then immediately superior to it is the tendon of totoro, or the eustachian valve. And here guarding the mouth of the coronary sinus is the Thebesian valve. And then also here is the orifice of the superior cable vein. So here's the superior cable vein entering in to the roof of the right atrium. And then here's the oval fossa once again, which is intact, and then the mouth of the coronary sinus. And then when we get to the, the coronary sinus, as we usually do, it's important to to remember the triangle of cock. So here's the mouth of the coronary sinus, here's the tendon of totoro, and here is the right-sided AV junction. These are going to be the landmarks or the boundaries of the triangle of cock, and at its apex is where we'd expect the atrioventricular node to live. So we'd expect the AV node in this heart to be approximately here. Now we see the right-sided atrioventricular junction here. There appear to be three valves, three valve leaflets, sorry. One, two, three. And one of these leaflets has direct connections to the ventricular septum itself, consistent with a morphologic tricuspid valve. We see that the ventricle itself has coarse trabeculations, and there is a septomarginal trabeculation consistent with a morphologic right ventricle. Now, when we open up the right ventricle to get into its outflow tract, we immediately realize what we're dealing with, and we, in fact, are dealing with double outlet right ventricle. And we can immediately tell, because of a coronary artery that's pretty prominent, that this is going to be the aortic valve and the aorta, and that this, in fact, is going to be the pulmonary valve and the pulmonary trunk. So both the pulmonary trunk and the aorta arise from the morphologic right ventricle, although there is some override of this pulmonary trunk over this intraventricular communication here. But in large part, both of these arise from the morphologic right ventricle. So why don't we turn our attention to the intraventricular communication itself. And here we see that the intraventricular communication lives directly below the pulmonary valve. In fact, its superior border appears to be the pulmonary valve itself. Then there is a muscular border here. And then its posterior inferior rim actually has continuity with the tricuspid valve. All right. So the posterior inferior border is actually fibrous. This Intraventricular communication does live in the Y of the septal band. So here is the Y, here's the cranial limb, here's the caudal limb of the septomarginal trabeculation. When we look at the pulmonary valve itself, we find three leaflets with three sinuses. And then here is the pulmonary trunk, which has been transected. Now, when we turn our attention to the aortic valve and the aorta. It does appear to be a little bit smaller than the pulmonary trunk. Right. And the aortic valve has three leaflets and three sinuses, and there appears to be one 
coronary artery arising from the sinuses. This appears to be a heart that has a single coronary artery as well. And then here is the ascending aorta, which has also been transected. So let's look at this again. Here is the morphologic right ventricle. Here's the tricuspid valve. There's an intraventricular communication that lives between the Y of the septal band and is immediately below the pulmonary valve and the pulmonary trunk. And then here is the aorta itself, the aortic valve, the aorta, and here's the coronary artery arising from the sinus of the aortic valve. Now let's go ahead and flip this heart over and look at the posterior aspect of it. Here is the left atrial appendage. And when we open up this more posterior atrium, we find a smooth walled atrium. And here's the mouth or the entrance into the left atrial appendage. And we can see that there are no pectinate muscles that spill outside the confines of the appendage itself which makes this all consistent with a morphologic left atrium. We see that the left-sided atrioventricular valve has two leaflets and has no connections to the ventricular septum, consistent with a morphologic mitral valve. Here's the anterior leaflet, and here's the posterior leaflet. When we look at this ventricle itself, we find fine crisscross trabeculations consistent with a morphologic left ventricle. When we look at the outflow tract here, we find the intraventricular communication here, and this intraventricular communication lives directly underneath that pulmonary valve. Oops, sorry. All right, so a subpulmonary intraventricular communication. And I think it's important to note that, and you'll find videos of other double outlets, the intraventricular communication generally isn't what is moving. Okay, usually the intraventricular communication lives between the, the Y of the septal band, the cranial and the caudal limbs of the septomarginal trabeculation. And what's actually changing is the relative position of the great vessels. So once again, here's the intraventricular communication from the left side. And I do purposely call this an intraventricular communication and not the ventricular septal defect. There'll be kind of two planes that you can imagine that the surgeon would close or could close. There's a plane of the ventricular septum itself if you just continued the septum up like this. But if you were to close this, uh, across this plane, you would then commit part of the pulmonary trunk to the left ventricle and part of it to the right ventricle which is not what we want. So what the, what the surgeon would actually have to close, in addition to doing other things in this heart, would be close the VSD in this fashion, which is a different plane from the plane of the putative ventricular septation. And so that is the intraventricular communication. And the, this plane would represent the true VSD. If you were to close that, you would then have an issue with obstruction to the pulmonary outflow. So do purposely call it the intraventricular communication. So here we have a heart with usually arranged atria with concordant atrioventricular connections with right-handed ventricular topology, double outlet right ventricle with a subpulmonary intraventricular communication with an intraventricular communication that has a fibrous postural inferior border. And, and that's it.